My next guest is a former corporate man, having spent time in aviation, telcos, uh, banking, as well as in financial regulation. But he is perhaps best known for his job as the former chief executive of the EPF, the Employees Provident Fund in Malaysia, where I think a lot of people don't realize that in fact it is the oldest in the world by way of dates and the seventh and largest by way of assets. I am of course referring to Tunku Ali Zakri, the um, now uh, retired uh, former chief executive of EPF. The reason I reached out to him and he so graciously agreed to agree to come to this podcast is following my conversation with Nohi Shah Hussein of EPF, I realized that retirement and retirement planning or the lack thereof and the sole prospect of growing old with insufficient funds and an uncertain future is a something is a topic which I think a lot of which touches a lot of people and is relevant to many, many Malaysians. And so that really forms the centerpiece of my conversation with Ali Zakri, as well as other broader issues such as what constitutes a successful life, how he spends his time, and of course, his origin story as well. As always, if you like this video, please do uh, subscribe to the channel, give it a like and share around with your network and friends, of which I would be deeply grateful if you, if you did so. And so, dear viewers, without further ado, may I present Tunku Ali Zakri. Tunku Ali Zakri, what a privilege and what an honour. Um, look, I, I just want to say, this is the first time that we're physically meeting in yep. person. Yep. Um, I just messaged you out of the blue and you very graciously agreed to do this. Um, and just in the space of like literally like 10 minutes of meeting you, I felt like we've known each other a long time. I think it's quite a bit of a testament to your personality and your you know the kind of person that you are. So if we can just get into the whole discussion in terms of um, you know where you stand on the ideas of retirement. Of course, you are the former CEO of EPF. And I'm sure you've got a lot of uh, insights in that regard. Mm -hmm. But maybe let's start at the start. And and t if you can let tell us your origin story, where you came from, who you are, and uh, you know your entry in the corporate world. Mm. Uh, well, do we have enough time for that? Yeah, this sounds yeah. like a Batman movie or something. <laughs> you know, the the, ma the backstory of the villain. Uh, so. I've always had this urge to go and do something of great impact and great value to people and society. And I think I owe it very much to my, to my father, who, uh, who was actually one of the main uh, players in setting up Felda in providing land for the landless. So from very young, I was exposed to going out into the hinterlands and really seeing how uh, people at that point of time, you know, it was like absolute real poverty and how the Felda program actually uplifted uh, them out of that. And um, so trying to fill his very, very huge shoes uh, brought me along this path, you know, meandering along from the financial industry into the mobile sector, into regulatory and all that. And I really found my stride when I went into EPF. And it's uh, quite interesting that you use the word, you know, former CEO of EPF. But to tell you the truth, I, I, I shy away from that whenever people want to introduce me because I tell them I don't want to be defined by my past. Yeah. But I think for context of the conversation we're going to have today and what we discuss, I, I think I might have to revisit some of my past also to and give you some backstory of the things that I'm going to be chatting with you about. So if you don't mind, you know, if I'll go back into my dark days, so to say. And um, it's rather coincidental to tell you the truth. I mean, we shared it just now. So this morning, while I was just going through my Facebook, you know, it comes up your memories from three years ago and Correct. whatever not, Correct. you know. So there was this picture that came up that I had posted of me sitting with Jane Goodall. And the Jane, humanist, yeah. The humanist. So she is like the rock star of the, the impact world, you know, in that sense. And the reason why I, I, I say that is because that same picture popped up when I was on the way to being told that I would uh, no longer be needed in, in EPF. Um, and that picture was what actually gave me a lot of strength to actually get through those very um, tough times, lah, to put it that way, you know. So to cut the long story short, um, you know, within a very short time, I went from, uh, you know, the top dog of the heap. Uh, you know, EPF is a gigantuan, right, in, in, in the Malaysian corporate sector. And even globally, I mean, seventh largest uh, uh, pension fund in the world. And the oldest. Uh, the oldest uh, uh, provident fund in existence. 
a lot of people don't know that um, you know and we were actually winning awards for innovation and all that right so I was the type of person who you know anybody I, I sort of like message on my phone would sort of like hey bro how are you man sort of thing you know yeah. so within a very short period of time from that position to suddenly I was I went into retirement uh, force uh, or enforce you know and uh, that really put a helter skelter into my plans because I was 51 at that point of time and uh, my plan was to retire at 60 so you can imagine you know within that uh, so nine years of my planning suddenly just went out of the window and I think that's that's a basic story of life, I think. You know, things are unexpected, and uh, it's how you get out of it and how you you address it. I think that's what uh, determines your success, I suppose. Uh, and to make matters worse, also was um, it was during a pandemic. It was really just uh, it was really the, the hot time of of the pandemic and 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 COVID. So it was uh, it was very trying times for me, um, and. All of a sudden, I went from when I was in EPF. So I started out in EPF as the deputy CEO for strategy and planning and policy and all that. So we did a lot of studies and, and research into retirement, the impact of retirement for Malaysians, you know, very academic, very report-based, data-driven, blah, blah, blah. I used to give a lot of talks on that, go up to cabinet to give presentation, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, from giving talks to suddenly living it, and now looking back, I thought that experience, um, though tough, is something so invaluable because now when I talk about retirement, I don't talk about it from an academic or very uh, you know, technical perspective. I can talk about having gone through it and, and possibly give that embellishment of reality, I suppose, in that sense. So I don't know whether that's enough of a backstory to our conversation today. Well, I know you as a finance person. I mean, you've been a banker at certain points in your life. You've been in regulation with Bank Gara at certain points, but predominantly in the financial services industry. La. But I guess in terms of the apogee of your, of your corporate career, I mean, being chief executive of EPF, mm. Wolf's number seven you know, pension fund by, by assets under management, is, is probably, the in some sense, yeah. the pinnacle. La, you yeah. know? So um, the fact that you even talked about planning at the age of 51, and, and I mean, a lot of people don't plan for retirement. It, it, it comes <laughs> upon them. It comes upon them like like some brick wall, and a lot of people yes. don't think in those terms. Yes. Um, and and even the idea of liquidity and sufficiency, we'll talk yeah. about all that, right? Yeah. But um, the other thing I want to also say is that this podcast doesn't discuss politics and politicians. I mean, yeah. for obvious absolutely. reasons, like, yeah, Absolutely. So we won't discuss the hows and the whys and the wherefores of your exit from EPF. But what was pertinent, I think, for us to discuss is really the idea of having the sufficiency of savings. Like, Absolutely. Which, are, which, are, which was, I think, in an oblique sense, the reason behind your Absolutely. early departure, like, you yeah. know. Absolutely. And the, the withdrawals and the bantwans and what have you. So can you shed a light from your seven years in EPF, what kind of insights you can share? What the sufficiency of Malaysian savings, um, how, how bad or how not bad is it? Um, what are Malaysians doing with their savings? How how sufficient is it? How can that whole idea of about liquidity and sufficiency yes. of liquidity yeah. be addressed yeah. from that philosophical angle? Yeah. So I think the one good thing about now no longer being an EPF, I can talk like myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I no longer need. I can. I can. I can share it with you exactly how I feel personally. I don't yeah. represent any organization anymore. Yeah. And you are <laughs> my Zakri. Yeah, Zachary, I am. Who Zakri? Right. Please, yeah, Zakri. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um. Okay, uh, to put it bluntly, uh, from a retirement perspective, uh, I think majority of Malaysians are not ready. Um, and unfortunately, unlike a lot of developed countries around the world, the social security net, the safety net, to ensure that we actually have a basic uh, access to living, not only just living, but uh, having a life of dignity, is uh, insufficient at this point of time. Um, I've talked a lot about uh, the insufficiency of savings. Uh, during the time when uh, I was in EPF, when we did a study, um, close to or even more than 50% of uh, members at that point of time exhausted their savings within two to five years of them uh, achieving retirement. Yeah? Uh, it's both a factor of not having enough money and not knowing what to do with the money, and also not being able to address the inflationary issues of actually living in Malaysia, right? Um, 
So in other advanced countries, you have the basic social security issues actually being addressed. So when we talk about social security, it's shelter, health, income security, nutrition, education, uh, mobility, and also in terms of the technology gaps, right? So for example, in um, you can talk about universal basic income. Right? That's going to take another two hours to go and talk about. You have um, some forms of social, um, uh, what's the word of it, uh, allowances that is also given, which is enough to ensure that you have a life. Once you have actually addressed those basic needs, then you can talk about the more higher reasons of being. So we haven't even talked about the issues that is now facing Japan called loneliness. Uh, in fact, in Japan, they've even come to coin a new term of death by loneliness being yeah. suffered by older people over there. Well, you can rent a girlfriend for an hour. She'll hug you for an hour. Yeah. And a lot of people in Japan, they, they need that. They right? need that, yeah. right? And um, uh, some some countries in the West, especially in the Scandinavian countries, they've come up with solutions to that, which we'll talk about later on. But in Malaysia, we can't even talk about those sort of issues because we haven't even addressed about ha people being able to go and put food on their table, people being able to go and have a roof over their heads. So for example, when we want to talk about affordable housing, uh, the technical definition of affordable housing is three times your average household income, right? Where so, can you buy a house at sixty thousand? I mean, what's the million now? Right? Less than two thousand, right? Yeah, around five years ago, it was around sixty thousand ringgit. Yeah. yeah, the average uh, yeah. annual income. So three times is hundred eighty thousand ringgit. Show me where we can go and get anywhere to live in Kuala Lumpur at hundred eighty thousand ringgit, and I'll call you a liar at this point of time. All right? So there's there's just no way about it. And once you reach retirement age, there's just no way you're not credit worthy enough to be able to go and get loans. So even the idea of retirement age, it used to be 55, early retirement 50. Now it's 60. Yeah. I think parts of Europe are now lobbying for 65. I think France oh, yeah. is 65, right? It's, uh, in fact, even further. Yeah. And But the thing is, it's a huge political minefield. Yeah. Because we have been fed on this uh, fantasy that once you go into retirement, it's la-la land. You know, it's, it's, you're, you're dancing around daisy fields or whatever, right? <laughs> and that is far from the truth. And if I can give you a bit of history, in fact, retirement and pensions is a, a human construct. Right up to the early 1800s, people used to work until they died. But, uh, and this is okay, now this is from literature from what I read. Uh, Otto von Bismarck, um, he came up with this great idea of selling this, uh, because it was sort of like, you know, um, uh, vote me as your council, a uh, chancellor, right? And I promise you at the age of 50, I think during that time, 50 or 55, you will no longer need to work and the state will pay for everything. Of course, it's a popular statement and that was when retirement actually happened by Otto van Bismarck. Um, and it's a wonderful fantasy. Right? You work as hard as you can up to a certain time and then after that, you just stop and you just do everything anything that you want. And it was actually quite funny because I, 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 when I was doing my, my research into retirement, I went into the definition of retirement and I couldn't find anything. I found um, in the Latin American countries, the word for retirement is actually uh, equated with celebration. Cele uh, I can't pronounce it properly, but it's celebration or something like that, you know? And in Japan, you know, they came up with that concept of ikigai which is the reason of why you get out of bed every, every, every day. Or the right? reason for existence, for in the, fact, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when yeah, yeah. you really deal, uh, yeah. dig deep, the whole reason why you have to get out of bed is because you want to exist. Yeah. You want to live life, right? So, And that was the concept of Ikigai, which again, we'll talk about it. Yeah? There are yeah. the, four, the four quadrants of it. Yeah. And actually how I have applied that philosophy for my life, uh, especially post-retirement, and how it has actually worked so well for me. You know? So in Malaysia... Um, we are not able to be to to be able to 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 meet that 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 ideal version of what retirement is, and I think it's about time that we need to have a conversation of what that definition is for for Malaysia. For me, for my personal idea, is that retirement is not about now not working anymore, because I think working serves a very vital part of existence to anybody. It gives you purpose. 
It gives you a reason of being productive and being able to contribute. Nothing is worse than just waking up and not being of use to anybody or anything. You know, and when when it when it happened to me again, coming back to my little story, um, you know, when I from one day of having meetings from nine to eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night, all of a sudden you wake up and you have the whole day stretching out in front of you. It's not fun. Oh, I can think of nothing more blissful than that. <laughs> yeah, that's, For me, at, at least, <laughs> that's the fantasy of it. Again, yeah. okay, yeah. because when you are no longer able to achieve anything meaningful. And when I say meaningful, again, coming back to the concept of ikigai, so quickly, ikigai is about doing something that you're good at, doing something that you're passionate about, doing something that brings you money, and lastly, doing something that the world needs. That's bliss for me, if I'm able to do that. But when you're able to do whatever you want, sure, now you can play golf or whatever, right? Play golf, play tennis. Or, but sure, you know, you might be passionate about it. You're good at it. But seriously, does the world need another golfer? And does it actually bring any form of money in? Because even if you don't need the money, the fact that you're being paid for it actually shows that you have value to give to the world. Okay? So when I went through that, waking up in the morning and just going, oh my God, I've got right up till what, 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock, and nothing else to do to fill up that time. It's horrible. It's horrible. And on top of that also, you know, majority of my contemporaries and my friends, they are still working. So when you call them to say, hey, you know, let's hang out. I say, look, I've got meetings. I've got this. So at the end of the day, you know, I went through a mini loneliness cycle also. But when you were retired unceremoniously at 51, you also went through your mind, do I have enough to retire on? Absolutely. Right? Thank so you. So the question, so I mean, what you're discussing at, before this yes. statement was obviously Maslow's um, hierarchy, hierarchy of needs, of, of needs yeah. right? People who have the base things sorted, then only you start to think of the higher things, right? Absolutely. Whether it's um, doing something meaningful, whether you find some spiritual awareness, whatever yes. it is, right? But, but you at need basic to have level, that. Is you need to have your, your savings, like your pot of yes. gold, like your nest yes. egg, right? Yes. For many Malaysians, yes. they don't have the nest egg, right? Absolutely. So what we need to do is have a discussion of what amounts to enough and I think for every individual, that nest egg sufficiency yes. is a very specific one. For you, it's very different from me because I've got my own very specific set of circumstances. And for Wafi as well, it's very different, right? Yes. So so let's have a discussion about that. Sure. So and especially for EPF, we've seen all the data, right? What does that data reveal? So as a segue, okay, as a segue, um, no matter how much money you have, when you're suddenly put into that position where it's so sudden, your first thing that passes through your mind is, oh my God, I no longer have a job. Will I now be able to feed myself? And for me, I am very, very blessed to actually have financial experts who I count as my friends. And they reached out to me. They knew what I was going through. And they said, let me sit down with you. Okay. They, they, were, they actually started out as my financial planners. And for some of them, uh, uh, two, two, two of them actually, I'm very blessed to have two of them. And I knew them when we were just as customer client, right? Uh, vendor client. And, um, but this was around 25 to 30 years ago. I knew them and they became friends. So when they sat down with me and we went through what I need and what I have, and they were able to just settle me down to say, you have enough to exist. Don't worry about it. You know, you're able to put food on the table. Worst come to worst, you are still be okay. So that provides a bit of stability. And I think for anybody out there, the first thing that you need to do if you are in similar situation or even if you're going into retirement, right? You need to ensure that you have that stability before you go higher up in that Maslow hierarchy of needs. Which was why when I was in EPF working with Sharil, we uh, developed the Retirement Advisory Services, RAS. Because we knew that a lot of people don't have the luxury of what we had of having private private financial consultants and all that. Not many people have that luxury. But we need to go and say that everybody should have access to that, which was why we set up the Retirement Advisory Services, which was the second in the world, by the way. Uh, we won awards for innovation for that, whereby we transformed the EPF staff from just being counter services because we also saw digitalization coming in. So counter, you know, like chopping your yeah. documents is out the window. So we needed to upskill and uptrain our people. And we went on the RAS route where 
our counter staff, our clerical staff, or anybody who wants to go, was put through a certified financial uh, planning exercise, and they are certified consultants, and they are able to go and sit down with the EPF members and advise you, and advise you on what you need and how much you need and how to do your financial planning. So just like you and I would need to do our medical checkup for our body every year, why aren't you doing it for your financial health? Well, I would counter that with two things. First of all, the idea of a financial planner for the normal Jola, for me, is troublesome. And the reason why I think it's troublesome is because most financial planners it's have a an it's a, it's a sell. It's a sell. It's an agenda, right? Exactly. They have their products to push and yep. therefore they push the products which gives them the best commission. Exactly. Not necessarily what is best for the person. Like, exactly. Uh, I would say That's that first one. Thing. Okay. The second thing I would also say is that for me anyway, um, what makes more sense is to learn, well, put in the hours and, and, and make financial education, financial literacy uh, on, on upon oneself rather than outsource that problem or yes. rather outsource that issue to a third party because you don't know where they come from, right? And I think in Malaysia, we tend to outsource a lot of things. We outsource our financial futures, our retirements to third parties and that can be troublesome. Yes. We outsource the care of our children to people we've never even met. They might have come from a jungle jung, jungle clearing in <laughs> Indonesia from two months ago and then now they're in charge of your child, children. And you leave them from morning till night with them. <laughs> exactly. And and etc. And yeah. and their health and to, to, to personal trainers and to the gym instructors and all that. These are three very important facets of life which are typically outsourced in Malaysia. I'm and I find glad. that troublesome. Yeah, I'm right? glad you raised this. Okay, yeah. the first thing is about uh, the credibility and trust. So if RAS at EPF yeah. can do this with impartiality, putting the members first and foremost, then it makes a ton of sense. So which was why the people for RAS were not incentivized with any products to sell. <coughs> EPF has no product to sell, right? Other than the services, which is mandated anyway. So all the more reason, there's no reason for us to actually, you know, to sort of like say, you actually don't have money and therefore you need to go and come up with this investment link insurance product. That's how it's not the sales is, and right? those are the worst. Kind. That's the worst. Yeah. So which is why choose your financial planners very, very carefully. I would suggest if you are going to engage a financial planner, firstly, know what you uh, are talking about. You better well, that's know. the problem. See, okay. most Malaysians, they don't, don't, they don't, they don't. know what they... So which was why we said set up RAS. With RAS, you have an impartial third party who has no, no inclination or no incentive to sell you any products. And guess what? They also have access to some of your financial products. So which was why EPF, the job of EPF was actually to go and raise the brand credibility of EPF to be one of the most trusted in Malaysia. Actually, during my time, we actually did a brand trust. We were amongst the top three most trusted, which was even in the private sector. And that is that is so important. And that was actually a lesson I learned from Tan Sri Zeti when uh, I was in Bank Nagara. And she was like, she taught me, she said, the currency of agencies and bodies in this area is credibility. If you'd have no credibility, you have no currency. Because we are the same vintage, I think, give or take, right? There was a time in the past when EPF was not as trusted, lah. Yes, we say. yeah. There was a time when yeah. it started to buy shares in MBSB, yeah, and it started to buy shares in RHB, and people were wondering, "Hey, are you a bailout agency?" You know, you know. And there was value cap at the time. I think things have moved along some material way since then. But what you say is true. Um, what I will also say is that individuals themselves, I think intrinsically they know what is good for them. Now. Yeah. They know that if they make $10, they should only spend $8 and save $2 or invest it. But most people, they don't do that. They don't do that. Something yeah. goes off in their brain when they come to windfall and then they tend to spend with with a high degree of it's profligacy. The, la, you no, know? it's the lottery winner's dilemma. Correct. Right? And within two years, as you say, all yeah. the savings are gone. La, lottery you know? winners within, within, within one year. You know, the research yeah. has actually shown yeah. most of them within one year, the money yeah. that they've won has gone because they don't know how to handle a windfall. And we saw that with the Bantuans in the wake of COVID. And you saw the five-star hotels full of people. <laughs> you saw the banquet tables were full of people. And, you know, and also well, it's good for the economy. It is fantastic <laughs> it for the economy. It started the economy back, you know. But, what but for the long term, but the, for the long term financial health of the people, I don't know. I think I'm I'm very concerned. Five to ten years of additional ten years. work. Ten years. Ten, yeah. ten years. So uh, a lot of the uh, majority of the Malaysians who had actually exhausted all their all their EPF savings will now have to work at least ten more years to go and 
come back to that level. But the reality of the situation is, which company is going to go and hire you after retirement for 10 more years? No, none. Right, no. so that's going to be a problem that the the government will have to to address. Do, sorry, I just wanted to come back to yeah. your second point about um, why go to the financial planners also. Yeah. Okay, yeah. now if you are lucky enough like me, uh, meeting two super trusted financial planners who became my friends, right? Um, never deal with your own money, because when you deal with money you must not do it emotionally. So similarly, even if you're a doctor, never self-diagnose. When me, who's used, who was entrusted with one trillion ringgit, I don't entrust my own money to myself because it's emotional. You need to have somebody who's of a third party who looks at money because money is just money. It's but just the counterpoint to that is that they don't know and, and circumstances can change by the day. Yeah. So yeah, unless they are so intimately connected to your life by the day, they can't tweak the portfolio or they can't tweak your situation. So which situation. is why I leave it to the professionals. So which is why when EPF was actually set up, uh, you know, the people at that time, the wisdom of those people at that time, they said, you need to have the enforced savings because you will not be able to manage your savings on your own. You need to be to go and put it to people who are professionals who will be able to go and tweak it at any time when the circumstances change to take opportunity for it and do it unemotionally. Trust you me, if you had bought your whatever, like Maybank shares, uh, you will sort of like say, hey, but when I bought it, uh, it was quite cheap, you know. And I think maybe a good name. Like, Never mind, I keep it, I keep it. But hey, you don't take advantage of volatility, for example, trading in and out because of the emotional aspect of it. So which is why, just like a doctor, never self-diagnose and never manage your money unless you're one of those very rare individuals like the Warren Buffetts of the world who can look at money and really treat it as money. Okay, there's that rare few. La. Very rare few. Yeah, yeah, there's that rare few. At a very high level, how do you think about your personal situation now? Yeah. And how is it kind of like allocated la, <clears throat> so, for so, the purposes of reverse engineering for people of the same So vintage? coming back yeah. to, you, you actually hit it on the hit just now. It's about identifying what you, uh, what you want and what you need. Correct. Right, so a lot of people out there have not really done a full-on um, self-budget for themselves to really understand what, uh, how much do they need in order for you to just to live in Kuala Lumpur. I don't think there's a lot of people who's actually sat down with somebody to go and do a proper budget exercise. No. And you need to have professionals, which is, a, uh, again, coming back to go and see the RAS at the very least because these are trained professionals who will be able to help to dissect what you need. Okay, then you'll be able to talk about what you want because my financial planners, they were very upfront with me. They said, Zachary, you know, when you reach your retirement age, of course, at that point of time, it was supposed to be 60, right? Tell me what is it, how do you envisage your life? And this is where you need to be open-ended. Don't be humble. You know, at, at, when I first started, I was like, going, no, you know, um, as long as I can have food on the table, uh, they just laugh at me and slap my face. What la. kind of food? Y you know, yeah. yeah. What kind of food do you want? You, right? Where do you want to have it? Tell me what is the best life that you want to live. And I went through that exercise when I was relatively young. So I had that space to really rejig my investments, my savings, so on and so forth, right? And be open-ended. So for, like for me, it was very simple. I want to have a life where I can go anywhere in the world for one month, no problem, and be completely comfortable. Okay, then the next question is, how do you get there and uh, where do you stay? Yeah, so then it boils right. down yeah. to, okay, in order for you to go and have that, this is the type of finance, uh, this is how much it's going to cost you, right? Mm. In order for you to get there, so this is how much you need in order for you to just live, in order for you to enjoy that. So you need to go through the financial service uh, consultant who'll be able to go through your, uh, you know, your encumbrances, your loans that you have, your insurances, so on and so forth. For me, I, I was also a bit of an OCD. La. To tell you the truth, I took my first insurance out at 23. Mm. For some strange reason, you know, I was thinking super way ahead, <laughs> super way ahead. And boy, did it pay off in spades. Yeah. 
because the type of policy, you know, the policy I continued to pay later on, I only got out of that in my four, late 40s because it no longer served my needs, right? But yeah. the price I was paying was the price that was priced at 25 year, years old. Yeah. So I tell you, the, 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 the insurance company was celebrating when I actually gave it up. <laughs> They were celebrating. So this is where, again, um, you need to start early. I know it's very difficult now for the young people. I during our times it was easier. When during our age, when we were in our first job, we were able to start taking loans to own a house. I totally understand that. And the young people nowadays they are struggling, struggling to even exist. Should they even own a house, though? That's right. a different question. Yeah. Okay, that's a different question because um, actually at one, uh, when I was in EPF and I was sort of like advising the cabinet, I, I was saying that stop promising Or everyone. Stop, stop putting the dream into people's uh, the dream minds. On, yeah, that people will own a house. Because the property developer lobby in the government is humongous, right? Yes. And it's in their interest for people to yes. want to own or to dream about to owning, do, uh, a house. owning a house. Why do you need to I would say as a base case, yes, you should own a house because it's your shelter, Maslow's law, yes. right? But if you can't and you kind of put yourself out an arm and a leg and a, and a neck, then maybe you shouldn't lie. Yeah. You know? No, but this is where the government promise should be about everyone will be able to have shelter, mm. but you don't need to own it. This is our old style of thinking. In the olden days, right, for us to go and show wealth, to show that we've uh, you know, achieved somewhere, you buy properties. But so, nowadays, so you no longer need to have that. the status thing, right? So, okay, so how would you advise, um, say, your atypical 28-year-old, okay, in terms of trying to secure their financial future, right? Yes. What is your template for, you know, planning for the future? Yeah. Again, uh, I think the first thing you need to do is uh, how much do you need for you to live for today, okay? Uh, EPF actually came out with, uh, with uh, a study called Blanjawanku. Uh, it was, I, I don't know where this at this point of time, but during my time, it was supposed to be published on a yearly basis, which would actually provide uh, guidance for everyone on how much they should be spending a month. And this was actually done in conjunction with University of Malaya. So it was an extensive research. And it was done like um, somebody who's staying in Kuala Lumpur is very different from the needs of somebody staying in Pulau Pinang and somebody in Johor Bahru, so on and so forth. And it was my dream at that point of time to come up with a national uh, budgetary uh, guidance for individuals. So that would actually help. I think if during that time, uh, if we were doing looking at some scenarios whereby if you were a single person uh, owning a car, this is how much you should actually be spending a month, right? Anything excess from there, then you need to go and ask yourself. Like for me now, owning an, a physical asset is no longer important to me because it's, it's illiquid. You know, it's very difficult for you to go and get rid of. And, you know, majority of the times, the only uh, upside that I get from it is from capital appreciation. So for me now, I don't go into, into physical assets. But for young people moving forward, if their plan is, you know what, I'm totally comfortable not having a physical asset because I'm just going to, r to pay rent my whole life through. Or even work remotely. Or you even work remotely. Thing, right? and, and work and, from home, right? Potentially. Uh, la. Potentially. You know, yeah. I, I, I would hope that by the time they reach their 30s and 40s, you know, uh, companies would be evolved enough to actually accept that. But anyway, you know, if they have made their decision on that, then their investments should not be about paying off a housing loan. It's about putting money into the right investment assets and the right type of products that meets their risk return profiles in order for them to, you know, by the time they reach 40, they'll then be able to upgrade themselves to a better uh, place of living, whatever it may be. Secondly, I think they also need to, to differentiate between the ego uh, and so what I mean by ego, right? Some, some people I, I've met, For them, they are, for them, they say, look, I don't care if I live in a broom closet as long as it's in Mon Moncara. I don't get it. I yeah, don't get it. Yeah. You're right? I would well, the gem is horrible. For the gem is horrible, but it's about that brand cash of living in Moncara yeah. or uh, last time it was Bangsa, right? Yeah. Uh, so now it's the Moncara. So if you're able to distance yourself from the ego 
and really, again, the emotional aspect of it, and really say, I need to live somewhere that meets my financial needs because I only earn X amount. And, and ditch that out of the way. That might actually help in terms of providing them a much more solid base for them to start going up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But unfortunately, and it's the way the business model is, uh, I mean, the, the model of the world is, right? It's all catered towards the ego. It's all about the brand. It's all about the coffee that we drink. Um, you know, sometimes why can't we make coffee at home as opposed to going out and paying for 15? Now it's 15, minimum 15 ringgit it's for coffee. It's the highest profit margin for them. OMG. I, I buy Americanos, right? And they're and even like them. 10 cents, you know. Yeah. And they're selling it to me for 12 bucks. I'm like, My God, it's, hell, man. But it's the whole <laughs> lifestyle aspect. Absolutely. And to a certain extent, look, again, um, being in the condition that I, yeah. I, I went through, yeah. I do understand the need because you work so hard every month. You can't afford a home. You can't afford a nice car. The only thing you want to feel good about all that hard work, so you need to go and spend into affordable luxury. And at this point of time, from what I see, coffees are an affordable luxury. It's something which is not big ticket items like buying your, I don't know, 2,000 ringgit wallets, which has a brand or whatever, you know. But now you spend 15 ringgit uh, 15 ringgit for me to be able to sit in a nice place, socialize with my friends and so on and so forth. But you need to ask yourself, la, if you it did, that becomes a habit, so like 15 times 5 problem. times yeah. 4, it's yeah. actually a huge amount. It actually no longer becomes affordable luxury. It is a luxury. So having that uh, discipline, the ability to distance yourself from the ego and think long term, do not think about, just like me, I went into insurance. I bought my first insurance policy at the age of 23. My insurance agent, uh, a big shout out to Narinda, you know, he couldn't believe he was having this conversation with this 23-year-old punk, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I just knew I needed insurance, you know, in that sense. So think long term, do not get emotional about it and have a real clear view between what your needs are and what your wants are. Okay, I'm gonna get a. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna get to a lot of flack for what I'm about to say. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Go okay. for it. So let's just say, without naming names, lah, without putting any names to the colors, right? In in Malaysia, you've got three different categories of people, generally speaking, and it's common assumption, urban myth, whatever, that certain categories are more profligate than others. Shall we just say, right? And then I'll point to other countries around the world. I think the Scots are quite famous for being stingy, mm. like, you know. Mm. I think the Dutch are also quite st famous for being stingy. And it's, it's maybe a cultural thing for them, right? So why is it that certain people are more easy with the money, more easy with the spending, mm. and some others are not? Mm. And can this be taught at a very early organic age so that you're not going to fall prey to that Starbucks <sighs> swilling, iPhone buying, yeah. iPad s binging crowd, yeah. you know what I mean? and all the streaming yeah. services that you can apply for now and then suddenly your cash flow every month is so much tighter because yeah. you're committed on a monthly basis you know, you know what I mean right yeah. so, so I don't I don't want to categorize that but why are people more some some people more predisposed to spending than others and how can we address it yeah. is there a way because no, I, I know you're a student of people I, I know yeah. because because <laughs> you read comics and we'll get into that later yeah later <laughs> I've, I've been accused by some powerful people up there to be a socialist stroke communist <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> too much into people yeah, you know yeah. But uh, I might get into a bit of trouble also for this, but hey, who cares? And I mean, I've already been into so much trouble. Now. You can say what you want. <laughs> and again, I might be generalizing. Yeah. Uh, and it might not be applicable to the younger crowd. You know, maybe I, this is more a study, I think, of my, our generation and maybe one generation yeah. after this, after us. X, and, the generation is X. In yes. In case you're wondering. My God, I, yeah, I've, I don't even know. What's the, what's the new acronym for the new generation? Z? Z? No, no, it's beyond Z, right? It's beyond millennials. It's beyond yeah. the new. Waffy is, what are you? Uh? Z. That, that and you're old already. You're considered <laughs> old already, right? So my yeah. daughter is, what is she? Uh? Alpha, Alpha. Uh, see, that's right, alpha, yeah. We are now going to yeah. Alpha Betas. And <laughs> I'd rather be known as being the X rated generation. X rated. Alpha rated oh, generation. <laughs> Not in a good way. <laughs> Not in a good way, but hey, who cares? I'm, you know. So, anyway, coming anyway, back. Yeah. Uh, okay, this, and this is my personal theory. Eh? Um, the first part to it is from a cultural aspect. I think uh, from the 
the the Malay race especially, we come from a very feudalistic system. And maybe for the Chinese also to a certain extent, right? And in a feudal system is I give my loyalty to the leaders up there, and in return you will take care of me. Right? There's and as I will just give you as much as is needed as long as you take care of my basic needs. That's the thinking about it. And and I, I, it has its merits, but it also has whether it's limitations in our current times. That's the first one. Okay? Yeah. The second thing is then it became to the policy, uh, the, the, the thinking or the philosophy of the government of uh, uh, and how Malaysia is very altruistic. I mean, don't get me wrong yeah. here, you know, and very paternalistic also where it is sort of like the government is here to take care of you. Uh, kita mendengar rintihan rakyat dan apa-apa rintihan rakyat we will we will we will plug in the gaps right and therefore it is the duty of those who have to plug in the gaps of 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 those who need it it's a good philosophy Robin Hood lah basically yeah, yeah. Well, in some sense <laughs> in some sense yeah, right? yeah. that's why to a certain extent taxes on the wealthy are being you know, which, which right? to me it's I'm not, not too sure whether yeah. it's the right direction moving yeah. forward but again yeah. we'll, we'll chat about this after this But with that sort of philosophy and promises that has always been given, to a certain extent, I think it has blunted our people. Because to me, I think you need to go through pain. Because yeah. when you go through pain, you become stronger and you become better. Okay, And I have found that there, is, there are also a group of Malaysians who actually want to be distinguished beyond... Uh, their racial uh, privileges and they actually take it as a negative to actually because then it's sort of like you're discounted your achievements are discounted right and they want to achieve great things and I have seen a lot of this especially the younger groups you know they are doing great things the founders the startups and all that is because they are frustrated with the inefficiencies of what's happening around them and the great thing about Malaysians is that they're highly creative. They find ways to go about around it and come up with great solutions. And that's why I think this one I can chocho Singapore a bit like, you know. That's why Singapore, they love Malaysian talents. Because in Singapore, things work so well. That it's come to a point of time where the, the people, and I, and this is has been told to me by, by Singaporeans, so I'm not just saying, that the Singaporeans are a bit risk averse. A bit. I, <laughs> I, I, I think I, look, look, I, I still want to be able to go to Singapore, okay? <laughs> And I have good friends in Singapore, you know. The creativity is not is is not there, you know. I mean, the strengths is they're able to implement, like they're really able to implement. But they bring in the Malaysians, the Malaysian talents, in to help them to think beyond beyond the box because that's what the young Malaysians has been trained. So coming back to again to culture. Uh, our generation and the generation slightly younger than us, we have been brought up and we are addicted to the idea that, you know what, it's okay. At the end of the day, the government is going to provide for me. But we are not set up like the Scandinavians. The Scandinavians, they are able to give that promise and they are able to deliver it because their tax system is incredibly high. What, 60 to 70% personal income tax? Well, the other obvious elements in the Scandinavian countries that the government there is very transparent, yes. highly incorruptible and very much cleaner than Asia. No, And people don't mind paying that high income Absolutely. tax because they know where the money is going. Well, they see the value, right? Yes, the they roads, see the real the hospitals, value. The housing, they see the real value. Exactly. The security, the police force, or the army, etc., right? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, and, and please, uh, you know, I'm sure people will be saying, you know, you are living in your bubble. But you look at the states of the roads in Bangsa, Damansara Heights and all that. And supposedly, yeah. the The most affluent part of Malaysia, it's terrible. But you haven't gone to Oakland Road yet. No, that's what I'm <laughs> saying. <laughs> you imagine if the so-called most affluent sections of Malaysia is in that condition, how about everywhere else? So where is the trust and the credibility of the government in administering our tax dollars? So, so the yeah. patriarchal society that we are now existing in has fallen down because yes. that that patriarch hasn't put the money saved into the children's hands. It's put into, into their own hands, so, right? You know, so, well, so, so the, well, I, well, I'm, I'm not that. going to I, go I'm into say, that. I'm saying yeah. that, right? Because but, 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 you know, so, so this is where the intentions were good. 
Yeah. But again, the saying is, you know, the road to hell is littered with good intentions. So I, I love the fact that the younger generation are not taking it upon themselves to sort themselves out rather totally. than look to Big Brother totally. or to the Patreon totally. to help them. Totally. It is absolutely required. So so this is when, again, I might get into trouble. Okay, I, I, I get really, really irritated whenever people, this I hear on the news and the B40s. You know, the B40s and the T20s. To me, the definition of B40 is not an economic definition. It's a mindset definition. I know some people who are rich people, but they are B40s because they are always saying, I don't have enough. And that leads towards greed. And then that leads towards corruption. That's B40 to me. It's not an economic condition because I serve on some foundations and I have gone out to some of the worst PPRTs in Malaysia. And there are such inspirational stories of single mothers. Single mothers. It's a war zone, huh? by the way. If you haven't been to a PPRT, eh, the worst ones, it's a war zone. But these single mothers have actually picked themselves up by the bootstraps and they have set up their own little businesses. And they have even created safe havens for children to be able to be there after school. Because if they were to go into the PPRTs, the, the vicious cycle occurs. And these people are not B40s. So that's where the future tycoons are coming from. Because... If they do make it, and some of them do. They've gone through tough times. Right. And Friedrich Nietzsche said this, right? Yes. That which does not kill you. Yes. Only will make you stronger. you stronger. So the problem in Malaysia is we have too much of that reliance. Manjilkan. Kita manjilkan yeah. sangat. And then we become weak. And that's a problem because yes. it's not sustainable. Even even the Chinese Malaysians. Okay. I can say it because I'm quarter Chinese. Okay. <laughs> even the Malaysian Chinese. And, and you know, I think you, you bring them to China, they'll cannot, be eaten alive. Cannot. Cannot, cannot survive. Cannot. The Malaysian Chinese are not the, the tough Chinese, right? It's okay. I'd, I'd like to say, in the last two months, I've traveled through um, parts when quite... I've been to the eastern side of China yeah. and the western part of China and I've also been through the Vietnam, right? Uh, for me, the hallmark uh, country in terms of industry is Vietnam. Mm. That's mm. a 100 million population country. Mm. Mm. They're working literally 16 hours a day, mm. seven days a week. Mm. They're all hungry. Mm. They're all determined. Mm. They all want to succeed. And then I come back home in Malaysia, we've got a plethora of public holidays. We, we get given public holidays whenever we win something or, or some government wins some, some election. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're working less and less every, every day. We're, we're desiring more and more. We're, we've never spent more money, taken on okay, more Okay, but I'm going to cho cho here. Yeah. I'm going to cho cho here. I don't know whether we're doing the right things to okay. stay abreast. You know, you know again, uh, this is where... Um, and I haven't even talked about China. China, yeah. there's 1.3 billion people. That's, that's, that's different. Busters, right? That's different. Yeah. You know, that, and that one, to a certain extent, is that maybe, you know, there's this economic theory of you need dictatorship. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think we had that form of dictatorship to a, at one part of our history. Which still alive. Which was, I'm not going to name names, okay? <laughs> but which was needed and actually did to a it certain worked. extent. It, it worked. worked. Absolutely. Whether for the long term was good or not, that's a different that different discussion. And that's what's happening in China because mm. they identify that that's a direction that they want to go and, and hell or, you come. know, come hell or high water, they will make you it come happen. Come along or you die. Yeah. It. Whereas, whereas in Malaysia, unfortunately, at this point of time, there is a lack of clarity of exactly where we want to go, which is then leads to the difficulty of then coming up with the policies to make it happen and to drive the agenda of the people. So, so which is why the young generation at this point of time, they've sort of like said, hey, you know what? I'm going to do whatever needs to be done. And again, because I'm in uh, MathCap, I used to be in MathCap and Pajana Capital and Venture Capital. So I deal with these young people. And for, for them, that is the true generator uh, for Malaysia and it comes back to what you were just your criticisms about people are not working enough or whatever I think you know what we are saying this because it's our definition of what work is no I, I think for the math cap uh, Panjana capital yeah. cohort I mean they are going great guns I mean yeah. they are they are caning at 7 days a week 18 hours a day they are they are building fast right I'm talking about Malaysia as a whole as, a, as an interior. no it's because know? Malaysia has lost its ikigai I think so We've lost so. our ikigai. For because the head is in some sense rotten. Are you, you know, like, I, I don't I, I'm not that. Saying, I'm no, saying, let's I'm, not go I'm there. Just like, saying, you know? I'm just saying, right? No, like, you know, you know uh, let's be compassionate. Like, you know, the, the situation of Malaysia and the way things have come up, they, 
it, that's why it's, it is the way it is today. And for me, I'm not going to flog this dead horse. It's just about what do we need to do to move forward, right? So for me, the solution, whether it's your personal financial situation yeah. or, your, or your families or your country, it has to start from the, from the self. Yeah. Because if you outsource that responsibility to the institution, which to me is no longer what it was in the past, no, yeah. then, then that's kind of like an almost a lost cause. Like, uh, it has to start with the self. So, so what happens is we have to go and come up with a new model. And if I may use that ikigai model for the country, okay, we need to identify things that we are good at. So, for example, what are we got good at in Malaysia? It's the fact that we have no. Oh, excuse me, that's going to be edited out, right? <laughs> you know, or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> we have a huge amount of diversity, right? The amount of languages that we speak, the thinking that we have, the ability for us to come up with creative solutions. So we are good at that. But Zakri, that, that's, that's what I have a real yeah. issue with because we have that diversity. Yeah. People celebrate it from all over the world, but we are penalizing that diversity. Oh, wait, wait. So I haven't quite finished. I okay. haven't quite finished. Okay. So we, remember our ikigai? Yeah. Okay. So then we need to be able to go and monetize it to make it into something that is of economic value. At one point of time, we were exploring being the, the outsource center of the, the world, right? Because we have all these natural advantages. Okay. Well, that ship has sailed really now. And as I said, at one point of time. Yeah. So we need to then find, I mean, I have a few ideas here and there, but that will be another discussion for another time. But what we are missing at this point of time is we don't have the passion. Because what are we passionate about at this point of time? Okay, if I can be a little bit uh, contentious, I think people have lost their passion because they feel a sense of hopelessness. Whatever they yes. do, it doesn't dent the machine because the machine is too big. Yes. It's irrepressible. So which is why the business model has to change. Like for me, I did go through that same similar process, right? And the machine did yeah, yeah. bunch you up and spit you out. It but, did. But it's, but it's okay because you know what? The world has moved on. And now I'm plugged into another form of machine which is the startup and the venture capital and world. Going oh green, my God. I tell you, that's what's keeping me awake and making me get so excited every day because the youth of Malaysia are incredible. The power, the energy and the ability. Our time, eh? Every time we want to do something, we sort of like say, hey, we better do this proposal to go and ask, uh, you know, hopefully uh, Putrajaya will go and support us and all that. Young people nowadays, uh, that's it. the last thing. They, they don't yeah. even think about getting it. They just do it. Mm. They just do it. That is the way forward. Uh. That's the way forward. That's the new business model that the country needs. And then fourthly, we need to go and find our place in this world that actually adds value to this world, which is why, and I'm going to put my plug here and we'll have another conversation on this, impact investing. Malaysia is poised to be the impact investing hub of Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, lack of creativity and imagination is not seeing this. And when, and I was again... At policy I, level, okay? At well, ground level, it's existing. I was, it's right? existing. In fact, there is huge international interest in Malaysia. I, I tell you that because they are reaching out to me directly. Okay, reaching out to me. They are willing to, it's a 1.2 trillion US dollar opportunity, by the way. Eh? And, and uh, the global uh, fraternity is looking into Malaysia because this is the last great frontier for them to put money in. And we are going to lose this window if we don't act fast. And when I actually raised this uh, to some people who lack imagination and creativity, uh, I was literally, again, and this was where you know, I was being accused of, um, the word that was used for me was, uh, I ha you have to be careful about this guy talking about me. You know? Cannot trust so much because this one is such a socialist, uh, a liberal socialist. You know? Everything he wants to do is all, you know, it was, and, and where is the money coming from? My God, they've got me wrong. My quarter Chinese blood is as good as like a full Chinese because it's for me I don't do things unless there's money in it mm. okay but when impact investing it's about the intentionality about mm. doing good and making money well it's the, the universality design. right of the thematic right thank you because Come. socialism is at, the, at the end of the day is about the people coming right? back to the social it's security about the infrastructure good, right right yeah. And if you have the right imagination and we are able to go and address the right areas, there's huge money to be made. For example, right? So uh, Impact Fund in Australia, they actually started uh, go looking at nurseries, okay, the uh, kindergartens that were actually going to go under. Because, you know, when you're operating on your own, you don't have the proper processes in place, so on and so forth, right? They went in, started buying it all up, started building up their capabilities, and now they are making double-digit returns. 
because and they guess what? It's good for the country. Uh, it's good for the kids. It's good for the future. It's good for the working parents. It's parents, absolutely. So but the intentionality. Both parents can go out into the workplace yes. and contribute to the economy. While the nursery takes care of the kids, yes, and it's well done because it's professionally managed. And it was it was not about uh, you know uh, altruism, pure altruism. It yeah, is because you do KPI. this because it's going to have yeah. double returns, uh, yeah. double double digit returns. So right? there's an IRR there. There right? is an IRR there. Yeah. For example, in America, for um, a group of people, uh, the funds also said they were very concerned about the lack of nutrition in the 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 hoods. Okay. Because the people in the hoods cannot afford nutritious food, is and that's the problem that's now currently in Malaysia. By the way, we have food coming out of our ears, but it's not nutritious, and we have terrible cases of uh, being stunted child, uh, stunted children, and you have stunted children, smaller children, smaller brain capacity. Yeah, mm. well, the people are the economy. Right? That's one of the three parts of GDP, right? Yes. Your people productivity. Your, your, your talent. Exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you're going to, and that's our future, if you don't take. So anyway, coming back, in America, they were saying, so what they did was they started doing the cloud kitchen concept and they started opening restaurants in the communities that needed the most help, hired the people from that community, brought down the cost of food. All of a sudden, you know what? It became the cool thing. The rich people started coming into it. The hood started being gentrified and the whole economic impact started coming up of that entire place. That's impact investing for you. Well, Southeast Asia is still developing and it's a highly nascent region. What makes Malaysia the potential... Nexus of impact it. investing. I love it. Okay, you, uh, we did not we did not discuss this by the way. Spont- <laughs> it's spontaneous. The day, okay? yeah. Number one, cost. Everybody who in the financial so our, industry, our Achilles heel is actually our our, our, our superpower as well. Yes, totally. Right? Yeah. Because you want to go and put money into Singapore, you, you can't it, afford it. No, okay, and I remember, uh, impact investing is all about returns. I mean, it's not as huge as some of those PE returns and whatever, but it's still returns to a certain extent. You have high cost, you're going to cut into it. You right? take care of the cost, your, your profit will look after your itself. Your profit will look after itself. Yeah. So that's one aspect. So that's why Singapore, and I know Singapore is salivating. They, they, are, they are moving whole hogs on uh, making them as the hub. Okay. The second part of it is in terms of availability. You want to go into Singapore, as I as we mentioned, you know, Singapore has got it all. What impact? What impact projects you want to do in Singapore? Well, if the shoelace becomes untied, they can't tie themselves. <laughs> yeah, no. So that's the problem, but right? But that's not an <laughs> impact just, project. I'm just joking, right? but no, right? literally, like, right? literally, yeah. And remember, I uh, oh, I didn't say about this, but actually, Malaysia is a petri dish for. Greatness, yeah. because we are not we are stable enough, relatively stable enough. We have a good group of talented individuals, and people can put enough money to do prototyping, right? Let's we forget we've got some entrepreneurs in here who are world class. I mean, let's not talk about Grab lah. I mean, some <laughs> one of the co-founders of Shopee is actually yeah. Malaysian, yes, right? yes. Coin Gecko, which is yes. actually a coin market cap in index, when they're, they're Malaysian, Malaysians. Right? Uh, I mean, there's so many. No, so don't many. you hate it when you get the stories about Malaysian born. And Malaysian bond. Else, right? but, uh, hello, who cares? You know, why aren't the Malaysians full stop? Get rid of the bond. Yeah, because right? they've gone elsewhere to reach the because we don't have the infrastructure to but see anyway, them through. Anyway, okay, anyway, that's so again that's, that's another one. Okay. Just, yeah, okay. So and Malaysia, because of our stability, our availability of talent, and also the ability for us to be that petri dish for innovation and creativity and greatness. It provides a platform into Indonesia, into Vietnam. I mean, yes, Vietnam is going whole hogs, but they are at a different level. So why are we competing with them at their area? We are above already. We have to move on. The new business model. And remember I said the old way of doing things has to be junked. We need to go and and we activate the young people who are willing. So a lot of the startups nowadays is about addressing social issues. And you address social issues. The money is there because the need is there. Okay. So in the ecosystem of of the tech world, right, there's a lot of gaps in the system. Now. Where do you think the levers are there to be pulled? Okay, so this is the again that the problem that I have when people talk about the tech world or tech investments. Eh? People when they put money in, they think that tech is an ends in itself. For me, tech is and technology is an enabler. But it's about the problem statement that you have that the technology will serve to go. To, to make it happen. So, for example, like uh, inclusive financing, right? Or, or uh, what's the word for it? Um, uh, uh, Grameen Bank. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm... Knows, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, it's about putting the technology in place whereby you're able to go and reach those who don't have branches. 
right? And there's a lot of people in Malaysia now, you know, the, the orang aslis, for example, use technology where all of a sudden they are bankable. Some of those platforms already exist. I yes. think the Securities Commission have come yes. up with the peer to peer lending. You've got people like um, you know, your 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 Yeah. Those platforms I can't <laughs> see. Right. They just yeah, dropped yeah. from my mind. Yeah, yeah. But those platforms in some sense already exist. Yes. They just need to be scaled up. So 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 the thing is um Pitchin, we, sorry, Pitchin, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. so the thing is I think we need to go and have a lot more out of the box creative, imaginative ideas. Unfortunately, uh, the policymakers at this point of time and not and, and I, I don't fault them, you know, because that's the way they have been trained and taught. They are looking at an engine that works in the early 2000s. But at this stage of time, we've moved on. And there are so many other opportunities, but we are scared to go into it. We are now becoming a bit like Singapore. Well, change is scary, right? Change is scary, mm. totally is scary. But you know what? What do we have to lose for Malaysia at this point of time? We have nothing to lose. And if we, and we, if we don't do anything, which is doing something, well, we're not going to get anywhere soon. So then it comes back to the retirement issue, you know. So when we talk about retirement, also the definition of retirement has to be changed at a policy level, and the thinking about retirement and old people as being useless. I mean, I'm fifty-four. I feel like I'm still in my thirties. Unfortunately, the wealth of knowledge that you can the bring experience. to the table and the energy that you still have. For at least, I mean, by the looks of you, you look very energetic <laughs> for the next 20 too, years no, at least, no, right? My problem is I'm too energetic. That's a problem, you know? <laughs> You're bouncing off the walls. No, right? but the problem yeah, but is, you see, we don't actually have uh, legal infrastructures in place to enable people like me or people who are reaching 60 who, and who are still energetic and have all the experience to continue work. Unlike in Singapore, you actually do have specific age-related policies and legislation to ensure and to incentivize businesses to go and rehire and reuse uh, the older generation. Retired doesn't mean you're useless. There is still, but it's just about having the creativity to go and make use of the natural advantages that age brings, right? And the thing is, of course, you don't go and put old people to go and do like heavy lifting and whatever. And even if there are physical, physical requirements, cybernetics, right? Put that into play. Cybernetics to go and help uh, assist. But... The care economy. So we talk about IR 4.0 line, IR 5.0, right? And we're all scared about it. We're always scared about it. To me, I always look at threats as opportunities because the growth of AI is also going to uh, uh, move into the growth of the care economy. People are feeling more and more distance, more and more lonely. Young people nowadays, again, you know, Wafi, you can, you can confirm this with me, you know. When they go out for a social, social meet, when we go out last time, right, the whole table is bloody noisy, right? Whatever. Young people is so quiet. They're on their phone. Because they're all on their phones. <laughs> but they are also in a social environment. That yeah. to them, that is social. Yeah. So to me, you know, technology is a powerful lever, but if you use it wrongly, it can also be a powerful divisor right yes you do interact in the uh, in, in different ways but nothing beats the human we are social animals and we need to have that physical element to that meeting that's why i suppose a lot of corporations always talk about this they are highly resistant to this work from home policy right and to a certain extent i do agree to a certain extent you know because you still need to have that human contact so you need to go and have the older people you know who can provide this sort of services so in Japan, for example, they came up with this rather innovative way in impact. Uh, they were also facing issues of uh, <clears throat> getting people to take care of young children. And remember you just said, go and hire these foreigners, right? And, and, and it happened, I saw that with my niece who started talking uh, Tagalog. You know, she was talking Tagalog. And it's no nothing fault, wrong with nothing, nothing yeah. wrong with that. But it's just that, you know, you are being raised by people who come from a different culture and different value systems. In Japan, what they actually did was, they actually married a kindergarten with an old folks home. Fantastic. So the old people Fantastic. went down and actually worked 
as caregivers to the kids. Fantastic. So parents send their kids to these spaces where these old folks suddenly become, of course, you know, you don't, you have some support system to help the kids running around, but the kids suddenly, you know, were like uh, uh, interacting with them. And you know what, right? This is something that, that it's not rocket science to device. You just need to be easy. <laughs> McKinsey doesn't need to be paid $10 million for a report. And, and, and Jin, Bain. Or Bain, right? <laughs> J, right? And BCG. <laughs> right? And Malaysia loves to hire this. And nothing wrong with McKinsey. It's fine. No, no, but, nothing wrong. Nothing this, wrong. But this is common sense. It's simple things. You know, and all of a sudden, all people were given a purpose in life. They were paid. And suddenly, they're healthier. They are healthier. They're healthier. They're more energetic. The purpose, all of a sudden, is imparting their wisdom Ignited, down. Yes. Loneliness. Remember, I talked about the loneliness issue. All of a sudden, these, these kids are now bringing life back. The kids now are being imparted with the value system, the strong core value system. The parents feel comfortable that, hey, I'm giving it to these old folks who love kids. Well, hopefully, most of them do, lah, you know? Yeah, just, but, but you know what I mean, yeah, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, it became a very virtuous. Uh, virtuous. Yeah. Okay, to a second thing now. This was actually done, I think, in Netherlands. Huh? They were having also issues of the affordable housing issues. Young people could no longer afford to 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 to, to live. Uh, I think Wafi, a few of your friends, I'm quite sure, you know, they are renting a broom closet and uh, and they are paying what thousand two thousand ringgit for a broom closet. Uh, yeah, you did it, right? Yeah. How much were yeah. you paying? Uh, Seven hundred. See. 700 yeah, ringgit for, for a bloom, bloom yeah. crowd. Uh. So what happened was in uh, in Netherlands, they then look again about this issue of loneliness and a lot of this locked-in equity on homes. So what they did was they incentivized these old folks who actually own homes to start opening up their 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 Other their rooms, their their rooms yeah. to rent out to the younger group of people. Of course, you need to go and have a filtration stage you know, to help them. But all of a sudden, young people felt connected to the older generation. The older generation now, are, again, have a purpose and get money and income, supported also by the government. So all of a sudden, you're killing several stones, uh, several birds with one stone. Housing issue, mm -hmm. affordability, unlocking, uh, unlocking equity in like fixed uh, housing, um, you know, providing uh, intergenerational contact. Okay, so practical solution i mean practical discussion here right in in the netherlands uh, and again this is just an assumption on my part the property developers are not as prevalent as they are in malaysia they would be the ones who would most oppose that because then they don't sell new stock totally and that's how they make money so i guess in terms of implementation the, the netherlands is easier to implement because i've got, again, a, no, no, I've got an answer for that okay so so malaysia we can so easily do that we don't need bain to advise us to, to do that right why is it not happening? Engage. You always engage in inverted commerce, the enemy. And when you want to talk to the real, the, the real estate developers, right? It's all about the money. And you cannot blame them because they have to go and show well, their returns, the PNL, right? right? Yeah. So what's there to go and stop, you know, coming up with policy intervention to go and incentivize them to retrofit these homes? Yeah, exactly right. Because we've got so much unsold stock, even more so, so much unsold yeah. stock. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. In fact, like some some countries, they've actually retrofitted their uh, their malls into hospitals. So the commercial return on that, obviously, the profit margin that they're used to from otherwise having had built that building in the first place. Now they're having to downscale. Yeah, like to that me, to profit, me, it's right? also a form of laziness because the, the our business model is always about I just sell and then make a quick buck. Whereas if you want to talk about sustainability, it's the about creating that. assets which will keep on giving you money continuously. Well, some developers in Malaysia do have that model. I think Selangor. Yeah, yeah. Some is of one them of do, them, right? but not enough. Yeah. Not enough. Not and enough. we have a huge. I mean, look, we just we uh, uh, was it. Uh, uh, we're going to have another mega mall coming up. We Do we need like another mall? In the head, right? Right? I mean, look at that monstrosity at where I live, you know, which that mall that has just been. Which, I didn't say it, okay? Guessing. I didn't say it. <laughs> it has caused so much negative impact from a social perspective yeah. in terms of the traffic jams the that has caused. Has been it's the, been yeah. completely, you know, uh, and in terms of the jobs, people might argue, but yeah, but we created jobs, what, to go and, and, and build and, and build and build it. No, you created jobs for foreigners because we are into the low cost model. Right, and this the foreigners that we have trained, they will go back and they will use the skills that we have, taxpayers' money and whatever not, in order for them to build up their country. Okay, what 
impact has it brought to the to the community of that place? Nothing, nothing. So we need to go and re-educate real estate developers and all that to start looking from an impact perspective. So coming back into impact investments, right? Um, so what has happened is that um, uh, again, a group of the funders got together and saying enough with the insanity let's look into uh, housing properties that have gone down in value go in buy it over retrofit it with uh, energy efficient sort of like infrastructure and all that and then resell it at an affordable price to people which they did and they did huge returns and they're actually managing the property, by the way. So it wasn't a, a, a outright outright sale. So it was more about the shelter aspect of the social security. And again, they managed the cost because they retrofitted it into low uh, energy consumption. So I think they use like heat pump technology, so on and so forth, right? So if you have the imagination and the creativity and the right intentionality to address the real need of society at this point of time, there's money to be made. So maybe it's not led by the public sector, it's led by the private sector who then get the public sector to come and assist in terms of yeah, yeah, the yeah, frameworks. Yeah. Because or really, I mean, these solutions are born of, usually born out of necess necessity and market need. Okay, but and the, that's the where the entrepreneur class No, but in. the problem is, you see, in Malaysia is that there is a public-private uh, um, partnership happening, okay, to a certain extent. But sometimes the public policy makers don't know where to stop mm. and let the private sector take over mm. you know the GLC each, phenomenon is real yeah you, you need to be able to recognize where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are mm. so it becomes a difficulty when you have when you have crossovers Right from the private sector, they have difficulty in understanding about delivery of public goods and public services. The public sector has a, a lack of understanding of how to run a business, which has real dollar returns. Right, real dollar returns. I think if we just come up with a revamping of the way we do our public-private uh, partnerships, I think we have a good chance at it. Because whatever we want to say, our infrastructure is there. We have good tools in place. It's just that we don't know how to use it. And the danger is now, the private sector is now moving off on their own, you know? Yeah, because they're, they're just are, moving off on their own. It's so hard to go through. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't see that impasse being solved because at the government, at the public sector level, they are fighting fires in terms of their stability of their administration, right? Yeah. We, you know what I'm talking about. No, no, yeah, four, I know. Four and three years, right? Yeah. Um, so when you don't have that permanence, it's the same thing as some football manager who doesn't come in on a long-term contract. He gets canned <laughs> after three months in charge and there's no permanence in, in the policy and the team. Right? I, I have Matches, a crazy idea. Do you know what I mean, right? Yeah. So how, how do you I have a crazy that? idea. Come, bring, bring it on. <laughs> okay, I'll either, I'll either get into a, me into a lot of trouble or it might actually, you, you know, at, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at McKinsey and Ben. <laughs> 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 Please hire me. I need a job. I'm a retired. <laughs> um, Okay, we have one system that uh, we've never really looked at to unleash, to provide stability and long-term focus, the monarchy. Okay. okay, that's interesting. That struck me because, for example, when I was looking at, uh, you know, the British monarch monarchy, they have that, that, that interactions with the prime minister, right? On a weekly basis. And the monarch, actually tells them, I don't care about your politics, I don't care what you're doing now. My long-term goal for the people is X, Y, and Z. What are you doing in order to meet that? So if we, if we cannot run away from the facts of life at this point of time, time is political instability. So in order to provide that stability and that balance, we need to go and engage the monarchies to come into play with their social blueprints for the Agong is for the country. And we saw that to a certain extent, you know, well, our I, previous um, Agong. I would suggest that that's an assumption that the families, plural, have their hearts in the right place and are not being compromised, okay. if you know what I mean. No, so uh, I, 
I'm actually involved with uh, so during the time of the previous Agong, um, uh, the the uh, PRP we call him <laughs> PRP Pemangku Raja Pahang. Um, he was asking for help in terms of how do you transform the economic model of Pahang uh, from logging into something which has sustainable value. And when I met up with this inspiring young man, uh, of course, I was a bit skeptical when I first met up, you know, because I was like, really? Sure. But when I met up with him, I saw he had his heart in the right place. He had his objectives and agenda, and he was all about sustainability. At his level, yes, but he's the cog in that family's machine. So, but during you know no, I mean, no, right? but during okay. that time, he was the de facto ruler because his father was Agong. Mm. Okay, and through his office, he managed to set up a tiger reserve within three months. To give you context, Belum took close to six to ten years. He did it in three months. And that was because he pushed it through notwithstanding the political elements that was happening in the administration. He just said, I totally understand what's happening down there. There are certain areas he will not go, but in these areas, I want focus on. Okay, let's pursue that discussion, right? If you, if, if you do that, then on what basis do you then not allow the floodgates to happen and all 10 families and not all 10 families have their hearts in a place or the what we say the right or the wrong no, place but, but, if you yeah. have that carte blanche to push through stuff you may not get the best stuff pushed no, through no no but you, you know think I mean? about it you think yeah. about it okay and uh, again I hope I don't get into too much trouble here um, when not everybody will be pushing for a tiger reserve like they might be pushing for other things no, no, but, but as long as it is about social impact and it's about sustainability, so the whatever the area. Of whatever, what is, what is, that what is needed for that particular state that they are in? Okay, because again... It's an interesting you, argument. Yeah, you it, can't, it have, water, a, you can't have a tiger reserve in Slango, for example. Or in Melaka. You can't, right? But what's the key issues and the key social impact that is needed to be done in that particular state? They need to be helped to be identified into the three things, four things, that the monarchs will then hold you accountable, notwithstanding today you are Menteri Besar, tomorrow there's going to be another Menteri Besar. I really don't care who you are, but this is my objective as the ruler of the state. And you are going to make it happen because this is long term. Is and it practically, uh, is it practically um, implementable? Because then who manages the monarchs? That, 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 that can so, tricky, so, so this right? is where you need to have some faith. Yeah. And I think for uh, and you need to have the right advisors to the monarchs, you know. Uh, so for example, so, the right no, no, so for example, right? Uh, and I have to say, for example, like Perak, I, 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 I am very impressed with the very, uh, very, very smart ruler. For example, right? Yeah, and Who, his common knowledge, he is, he's pretty much with it, lah. That's yeah. right, yeah. and he is, and he is driven through social good. Mm. So the things that, that that I'm seeing, that I'm seeing anyway, you know, it is driven through social good. Uh, so, for example, also I'm seeing like um, the 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 uh, Negri Smilan, uh, not because my parents come from Negri, but because I also interacted with uh, Tengku Ali Ridaudin, for example, mm. you know, very one. smart yeah. ex ex Kazana fellow and all that, right? And and now he is in a position to be able to effect change. So, so being in that position. It's the choice of who you have to, 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 to advise you. And for me, I think if we use the institution of the monarchy for Malaysia, it can actually be used for, as a force for good. And again, it can go through bad or it can go through good, right? And for the Pahang, for the Pahang royal family, they are immensely popular. You can see the Agong is immensely popular. I think if he were to to stand for prime minister, you know, he would win. You know, if he were to stand for voting, he's an immensely popular because of the activities that he uh, he's espousing, mm. and maybe that is what we could we could actually incentivize the monarchs. It's about when you do good for your people, your people will love you, and which human being doesn't like to be loved. Yeah. Okay. So I'm 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 ordinary Joe, right? Um, if I don't like, theoretically at least, if I don't think that the prime minister is doing a good job, theoretically I can vote him out. You can't vote the monarchs, though. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. So you're putting a lot of a fair amount of faith in something that you cannot 
control. But but and if they don't do what the public believes to be of social impact, by definition, definitions can be yeah. very broad and very yeah. malleable, like shall we say, right? No, but but then you no no no, but don't 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 also forget, right? The monarch, uh, the uh, the royal institutions is something that has been going on for centuries, mm. and it has always rested on uh, the shoulders of the people. Uh, then there have been many cases also in the, the monarchies where it, if it is seen as zalim, and this is also supported through religion, for example, right? The Malay people, we are very forgiving. We are very nice people. But there, there does come to a point of time where if you, are, if you are not able to fulfill your duty and requirements, uh, they don't stand quiet for it, lah, you know? So, and again, the definition of what a good and evil is is very different yeah. from you and me and from yeah. anybody else, right? Yeah. So, we need to come up with a common definition of good. And for me, again, I would come up with the definition of good is, let's look at social impact. We can also advise the monarchs to go and say, these are the areas that you can... Remember, I told you the seven areas, right? Yeah. So, uh, shelter, health, income, security, nutrition, education, so on and so forth, right? In certain states, for example... um. Another inspirational story because, and this is another person that I would like you to go and talk to, uh, Peter Ong. Peter Ong, he is my partner in crime in uh, my theatre, musical theatre. But he has transitioned from uh, musical theatre into a photographer for nature. And he was also one of the, 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 the people instrumental in bringing Jane Goodall into Malaysia, right? And he has, he's a very good photographer and he loves to take photos of primates. And he discovered that there's one primate in Perlis that is found nowhere else and the only primate that actually exists on limestone. I might be explaining it wrongly, but this is what has been told to me. He went there to do a very simple project. And from there, he suddenly found out the biodiversity of Perlis that nobody knows about. Have you visited Perlis? No. Exactly. Much, yeah. And he, he started putting up his little blog saying, what's in Perlis? Before you know it, he was starting to attract, you know, visitors from Singapore and, and people started visiting Perlis because they're the uniqueness of Perlis, right? And it attracted the attention of the royal household. And through the intervention of the royal household, they suddenly saw, wow, this is an economic driver for Perlis because other than, you know, uh, the mangoes over there and all yeah. that, there's not much. Yeah. And they suddenly... It's a, it's a stop on the way to Thailand or from Thailand. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And through the work of Peter Ong and through the royal family, that suddenly it just, they just connected, by the way, because they started getting interested to know, hey, what the hell is this Chinese guy from Kuala Lumpur going up in Perlis, talking like, like a Perlis person now, yeah. you know, yeah. and talking how wonderful about what Perlis is. And that inspired them to go and make the whole Perlis into a geopark. Fantastic. So this is where the power of the monarchs, again comes into play because they are now going into a social good into uh, climate change into environmental protection into job creation so all of a sudden job creation because in order for you to go and have geopark you need to go and have people who knows how to go and um, the guides the researchers now all of a sudden you need to go and have uh, little hotels boutique places for people to start staying suddenly F&B starts coming up and now it's no longer it, it, it becomes a place to visit rather than just as a transit point into Thailand very so, important so do you see little economy by itself it becomes a new economy yeah. and this happened over the space believe it or not nah, I was in shock it happened over the space of around a year should we go there? You should. Uh, no, I'll, seriously. I'll it, I, I I'll went there. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you the contact of Peter and you're going to get him to yeah, talk yeah. about this yeah, yeah. and you better get him. And you know what? Through his, exp uh, through his photography, they actually found a, a, a cave full of this prehistoric pottery which has never been discovered before. No. Oh. And all of a sudden, it's become a, a place a of, of, of yeah. historical interest. So that's why I'm saying... <laughs> You know, think creatively. Think out of the box. Get out of our hopelessness. There is hope for Malaysia. There's hope for Malaysia. And just utilize the strengths that we have. 
only if we recognize it. You know, maybe some people sort of like say, why do we have monarchs? You know, what value do they bring? All of a sudden now, when I shifted my thinking, I was like, oh my God, the monarchs have such a role to play in this modern world. And because the young people are, they are looking for role models. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They are looking, they are lost. Let's, let's go beyond the warlords. Yeah. Man, you they know are what tired. They, they, what, the, 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 the role models they look at us are at this people, right? But now all of a sudden, PRP, you know, uh, Tengku, Asana, Tengku Asana, he is now such a role model for the young people. I mean, uh, notwithstanding that he's also single, he's around six foot and he's, uh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, he's yeah. quite pleasing much. on the eye. <laughs> My God, you know, his fo- the female following that he has is like <laughs> amazing. But hey, you know what? Now they're starting to listen to him. Now they're starting to go and say, hey, maybe I should start looking into climate change and, and environmental protection. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of good that Malaysia has, but we just need to learn how to unlock it. Let's take a different tack. Um, I, I meet a lot of corporate people, right? Yeah. And they typically come from the accounting, legal, audit, kind of like tax background, dry, dry people. Lah. Very meticulous, very detailed. Um, but not often they have that complexion that that you might yeah. bring to the table in terms of, you know, your colourful, you know, <laughs> non-corporate side, which is, you know, the theatre, <laughs> the plays, right? I mean, comics, you you're, you are a student of people. Yeah. And yeah. that's really born out when you tell me about comic books and the kind of people that you read. Yeah. And then instantly you've got an insight into what kind of people they yeah. are, right? Yeah. That's important because yeah. it, it gives you the ability to be a creative solu- yeah. solver of problems, yeah. right? Talk to me about creativity. How can people, and why should people be more creative? Okay. And how can they get there? No, you know what? Again, not to disparage uh, the the corporate leaders I that think we have. I didn't say that. No, no, no. No, <laughs> but, I, no I'm saying yeah, it. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying it. Yeah, yeah. And I think they were needed for the time that Malaysia economic uh, evolution was going through. You needed to go and have the econ uh, the, the 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 detail the, oriented the, the, the numbers. People, yeah? Right? yeah, you needed them, um, and you still need them now. But at this point of time, because of the complexity that we are going through, you need people who's able to go and connect the dots. Now, my career has always been a strategist and corporate planner, to tell you the truth. You know, I've been doing strategy and corporate planning for whoa, over 30 years, over 30 years worth. Of, of, of that and my background comes from as I told you I've come from um, you know mobile f- uh, mobile from uh, banking from regulators from training of people to oh my god what else did I do I've been doing so many things right so I've got my fingers in so many places I'm not I'm not a master of one, but I'm a Zach of all trades. Hear that? Zach, hear, that? Jack, hear that? Hear that? Hear that? I had that word play, okay? Um, and when I went to EPF also, I was brought in to uh, as Deputy CEO of Strategy. And, you know, and everything that was that didn't fit the normal thing was thrown to me, right? Uh, human, human resource, talent development, branding and marketing, policy development, uh, legal. It was all was it legal or strong? I can't quite remember. Lah. But, you know, so that gave me the ability to think beyond and out of the box. And that was my job, actually. That was my job. But nowadays, with the complexities that we are facing and the issues that we are facing and the instability that we are facing, the type of leaders that we need are not the ones who are the bean counters. Uh, yes, I know some of our political masters because they themselves want stability. So they want people whom they can trust. They want people who can just give me the data because I need to be the one who, who who provides the big big picture solution. But my pushback is I think you need to have those type of leaders also in the GLCs. And I think to a certain extent that was why like EPF became such a powerhouse, not only in Malaysia but internationally under Sharil and myself. Because Sharil uh Wow, yeah. <laughs> He's a very dear friend of mine also, but he is, he is an intellectual giant, intellectual giant. And I was the one who was able to assist him to actually put his uh, plans into place, into a coherent strategy, you know. So I had this little chat with Wafi where he was like saying, oh, I can be only a number two. And I said, there's nothing wrong in being a number two because in order to, to be number one, you need to have good number twos, right? And when I took inadvertently took I never wanted to be a CEO as I mentioned to you right but it was uh, I was a CEO by accident and by accident I found that my skill set was actually needed for EPF because I had the 
best investor uh, professionals because I don't come from the investing background, right? And in fact, even the investment folks, when I first became CEO, they were giving me the eye. They were like, who the heck are you, right? But I think it was because I acknowledged that I didn't know what I didn't know. And I used their capabilities that we came up with some pretty amazing stuff. So for example, EPF is the first provident fund in Asia and retirement fund to come up with a sustainability policy in investments. We were way ahead of the CPF. In the beginning, and we started up like our sustainability practice way back in 2008 and 18. And the team that I set up, which was composed of the best and brightest of EPF, by the way, they came to see me and they said, boss, why are you punishing us? Because they didn't see it at that point of time. They were saying, I'm the best at investments and all of a sudden you put me in this thing called sustainability? Why? Right? But lo and behold, sustainability is now the, because my background, my training foresaw that and I prepared it. Yeah, but do the returns justify uh, the moniker? Depends on what type of investor you are. You know, Are you a short-term uh, investor or are you a long-term investor? As a provident fund, we deal in decades. So that type of asset profile fits completely well in the, in the, uh, in the um, pension fund uh, model. If you are sort of like an, um, an equity-based sort of fund or where you need to have volatility, sustainability at this point of time has a bit more difficulty. Okay, You go into sustainability stocks because you want to make it as from the basis of your portfolio. You know, that solid basis. Then you need to go and get your beta, your beta returns, right? So again, it's what sort of investor are you? If you are a long-term, uh, you are about uh, fundamentals, sustainability is the... We actually saw that um, most type of investors, the type of returns that they want to see is within the time frame of what, five to seven years at max? I mean, if you are P investors, it would be around seven years, right? No, but that's not the EPF's profile. Lah. Yes. Yeah. It's For, lifetime. Basis. It's lifetime. Yeah. And we saw, and we actually did a study on this. We saw on average that for sustainable base assets investments, your returns comes only in around year eight or year nine. And during crisis, it's your sustainable uh, portfolio that will actually uh, uh, support you because it's not in high-risk assets anyway. And it's into uh, investments into the things that people need, which people go back to in times of crisis. It's back to food, shelter, clothing, right? So the EPF right now is nearly a trillion ringgit, I think. It was it 950 or something? Well, right? during my time, which I am proud to, to say that December of 2020, the few months before I left, we breached 1 trillion. One trillion. So it's well over a trillion now. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I think that was what was last reported, mm. you know, but oh, I don't yeah, know. Because we had the, the BSHs yeah, yeah. and all that, right? Yeah, there was a huge so uh, out, outflow. So, so, so I just saw this morning um, the Norge's Bank of um, World's Biggest Sovereign Fund, right? They just made two hundred thirty billion in annual net profit. I mean, that's huge, right? Uh, where, where is the, where does the EPF go in five to ten years' time? Because we all know right, that the bigger the fund it is, the harder it is to get, you know, decent returns, lah. Decent meaning five to seven percent, right? Um, where does it go from here? Look, I'm not going to go and say it was because of me that we, we gave very good returns. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the type of returns that, that I was able to report on was on the shoulders of giants. You know, the Tantri, uh, uh, Tantri Zainal. Uh, oh. Aslan Zainal. Aslan Zainal. Yeah. Sharil. Yeah. Um, and, and the things that we put into play. So, for example, the diversification into global. <clears throat> that happened during Tantri Aslan's time. If not because of that, uh, and going into international markets, uh, EPF would have great difficulty because Malaysia is just so big. There's not yeah. that many places to go and yeah. put your money in. So for example, the MAG7 stocks, right? Would you even have the ability to take a position in them today? Uh, no, uh, no. Right? if I were to go and take a policy angle mm. right, at a, at a Putrajaya level, you are looking at all the GLICs which mm. is in place. Mm. You're actually having a concentration risk. Mm, absolutely. Because me, as an individual, I have money in EPF, but I also have money in uh, ASB, PNB, ASB, ASB right. and PNB and all that, right? Mm. We, we do, I, I don't. Uh, right. But you, if, you, if you so choose, there yeah. might be some of your unit trust also which is Malaysia-based. Correct. Correct. 
Right. So what's what's happening? You're putting your your money into the same areas, and well, should anything right, happen, right? yeah, should anything happen, boom. Okay. Being diversified geographically, right? You also uh, shield yourself from that concentration risk, and also you take advantage of FX uh, uh, FX uh, uh, movements, and that, right? right? Yeah. And when you have a good enough group of professionals uh, running your fund, you can make magic. If you are the EPF CEO today, and I'm not suggesting he should even consider uh, this, right? Uh, right. Um, right? Would you look at the Bitcoin ETF? What was that? The Bitcoin ETF. Bitcoin. ETF. And yeah. ETFs. Uh, Bitcoin, <laughs> I've, I'm very traditional. Mm. Okay. I like to go and uh, invest in, especially if it's this huge amounts, uh, I would like to go and invest into things that are tangible. Call me old-fashioned lah. Okay, call me old-fashioned. Well, old fashioned. the tires, right? So yeah, I can really kick the tires. When you have like Bitcoins, I, I, I don't know what to kick. I, I really don't know what to kick. Mm. And you know what? There are so many other types of asset classes that can meet my type of objective. So why go into, Bit, uh, into Bitcoin? There's no reason for me to go into Bitcoin. For me, I would only do it as an individual if I feel like punting. I want to get an adrenaline rush, right? Mm. So because people made some obscene amounts of money in terms of the timing. EPF's investment philosophy has never been about, you know, uh, going into it and punting. We go into things, uh, oh boy, I shouldn't say we, I'm no longer an EPF, the way I talk, right? <laughs> EPF is all about EPF fundamentals. EPF trades in and out of stocks all the time. You oh yeah, but it's all based on fundamentals. Right? Yeah, of course. It's all based on fundamentals. But it's still you should of course you should trade lah, because it's also in terms of like uh, you can only give div- <laughs> EPF can only give dividends based on realized returns yeah. you know you don't want to go and have it on paper returns unlike some funds yeah. some funds reports purely on paper returns yeah. I mean come on lah, what bullshit is that right for me it's about real returns yeah. so you have to go and trade in order for you to go yeah. and get your profits yeah. but the key question is where, that, where do you then reinvest mm. Right and EPF being where it is, it is able to go into some choice assets. Mm. So, like for example, when when they were doing PE, right? PE was uh, initiated during Sharil's time. Private equity. Private equity, mm. and the type of players that you are dealing with are like the KKRs of the world. You no think, joke, uh, guys, yeah, yeah, you think if EPF didn't have that money, you think they even they even talk to you? Mm. Come on, man. Yeah. So, but so, but once you have a strategy that starts to unravel some of the things that had been that had taken years to build up and especially like for example in PE it's all about relationship eh? and relationship takes years to build so so this is where I'm just a bit cautious about some decisions that are being made that is sometimes very knee jerk uh, but again you know I'm, I'm long term in value some some objectives are very short term mm. so maybe that's why it doesn't jive but I worry yeah, well, they do follow election cycles, right? <laughs> I, I'm saying yeah, that, not you. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I worry about too populist of movement, and when and decisions are made to just deal with the current problem and not and just kicking the can down the road because the road is running out. Mm. The road is mm. running out, um, and we're running out of options. And we're running out of options. We need to have uh, uh, we need to have people who are willing to have that courage to really go beyond the uh, the status quo, because we need to reinvent ourselves. Yeah, we need yeah. to reinvent ourselves. The Malaysian narrative. The Malaysian narratives. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've met some uh, you know the impact investors, for example, and I I, I asked them. I said, so what do you think about Malaysia? And they say we don't understand your narrative. They don't understand it. Mm. And you know about investors. Investments is all about clarity. Yeah. If there's no clarity, I'm not going to put my money into you Absolutely. because I'm not able to go and quantify my risks and returns. There's no way I'm going to be able to do that. But but uh, but again, la, you know, uh, I think the policy makers have to be able to have thick enough skin to call a spade a spade because some of the things that needs to be stated is not comfortable. It's not nice, you know. Uh, in fact, one of my uh, resolutions for 2024 is to be kinder but not nicer. You know, um, uh, it needs to be able to go and say 
and admit that maybe we didn't do as well as we keep on talking about. For me, when I used to lead people, I never punish people for doing, uh, for making mistakes. Mistakes are essential. Yes, because if you don't make mistakes, you don't learn. Correct. But I punish them if they repeat it and they don't learn from it. Mm. Okay. But in our case, at a policy level, if we don't even admit we have issues, how are we going to come up with solutions? I To me, you know, as a leader who admits to shortcomings and, uh, and gaps, it's not a bad leader. It's, it's leadership. It's leadership. one's deficiencies. It's leadership. Yeah. You know? And it's, it's uh, a, uh, you need to have, you know, leadership is about admitting where you don't have your strengths in. But yeah. then what do you do about it? Yeah. Right? What do you do about it? So, so, so that's what I think we need for Malaysia at this point of time. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to um, leave us with three thoughts of yours, which are, you know, dominating your, your consciousness at this point in time, how you're thinking about, you know, the world at large and your own personal self and, mm. you know, um, your own personal ikigai, lah, you know, mm. uh, to you know, kind of like bookend our discussion. We talked about a lot of things, you know, but uh, maybe, maybe three, three things from you mm. in terms of maybe the top three things that are, you know, dominating your, your thought processes. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, 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 thank you. Thank you for that. In fact, it's also a personal reflection of me when what helped me get out of my doldrums uh, when, when I, yeah. I, when, you know, I was, I was, I was, I had, no, I'm getting a bit emotional here. <laughs> when I had no job, right? Uh, number one is, I think, have faith. Uh, we talk about faith and it's different from belief. Belief is in, when something has been proven. Whereas, whereas faith is having belief in something that is, has totally no background, but it's your gut. You know? Have faith in yourself and have kindness for yourself. Um, have the courage to actually transform uh, and reinvent yourself. Um, and also don't lose hope uh, by, by, because I think the future is not about um, making things happen, uh, you know, things happen to you, but about making things happen. Uh, you need a lot of energy. You need to have a lot of faith. You need to have a lot of belief in order to go and transform that hope into reality. Yeah. And lastly, also what, drives me in terms of the hope is because uh, when I interact with the, um, uh, what's the word? I don't want to use the word normal Malaysians because there's no such thing as normal Malaysians. Um, Malaysians, yeah, yeah, you know, Malaysians on the street, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's the single mothers from the yeah. PPRTs, yeah. right? Uh, the Wafis of the world who's yeah. so young, but you know, who's gone out to go and set up his own startups and all that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Kylie's of the world who yeah. just saw an opportunity and had the tenacity to just go out and, and do it. Yeah. You know, um, there's so many stories of inspiration of, of mm. typical Malaysians who are not typical. Mm. And these are the things that, that empowers me and gets me so excited. And finding creative solutions to the real problems that we face, you know. And also having compassion and empathy to, uh, uh, to people in Putrajaya, for example. It is not an easy job they're doing. Uh, and I can understand. It doesn't mean that I'm happy with it, right? But I can understand where they are. And they are not driven by evil intentions. But they are also um, uh, sort of like hemmed in by the realities of the situation at this point of time. So let's have the compassion and the kindness to work with them. Remember, we talked about the public-private uh, partnership. Yeah. And I have found in my experience with the right narrative, with the right energy, with the right humility, um, Putrajaya can actually activate. You know? um, so... Malaysians don't lose hope. I think I think there's still fight in us left. And I think that the trials and travels that we have gone through 
Oh God, you're going to edit that that <laughs> verb again, right? <laughs> Just because of the hot chocolate you gave me. Yeah, you know that the trials and tribulations that we have gone through, uh, I think, is has created this new generation of Malaysians. And I'm not talking about age, uh, by the way, because there's also it's Generation Malaysia, which is young, old, middle aged, whatever, who've actually gone through it and said that Malaysia boleh. Remember during COVID, how we all came together irrespective of race and religion the, flags, right? the yeah. flags that is the true promise of Malaysia for me I mean, I mean through the worst of period it created the best of us and I think if we remember that experience and we don't lose hope and we really have faith I think we can make the Malaysia that we want here 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 my friend thank you so much for your time <laughs> 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 Thank you.